thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. It's a great honor to um, come back to the University of British Columbia. And a bit of an intimidating uh, uh, experience for me because so much of the research that I'm going to talk about this evening was actually done here. I'll mention some of the labs that were involved in some of this uh, uh, really very interesting work that Mary said is, is, is really turning biology on its head and suggesting among other things, that we're really not quite as important as we think we are. But reflecting my interdisciplinary interests, I'm going to start off with some poetry. What's the greatest poem ever written in the English language? There is, of course, only one answer to this question. So, Paradise Lost, you got it in one. What's, what's, the, what's the second choice? What's the other one you might have picked? I give a talks like this on a number of occasions, and another poem often comes up, but Paradise Lost is clearly the correct answer. <laughs> Spencer's the Fairy Queen. Even, even more intimidating read. But I've got a copy of Paradise Lost here. This is an 1824 edition, miniature, uh, miniature edition of Paradise Lost. Um, and this is actually the same edition, not the actual book, but the same edition that a very young naturalist carried with him when he circumnavigated the globe in the 1830s. Darwin apparently um, had a little pockets sewn into his field jacket that would have set books of this size, so that when he um, carried out his researches, his expeditions on land, he would be able to pass some time on horseback, for example, and uh, in other idle moments, reading Paradise Lost, and he committed huge chunks of the poem to memory. And his eyesight at that time um, was considerably better than mine is now. It's being a miniaturized edition. But I'm just going to read you a very short um, excerpt from this book. I'm not going to take my glasses off to even make an stab at reading this. And I'll come back to this later in the presentation. So it's from Book 4 of Paradise Lost. In this pleasant soil, this far more pleasant garden God ordained, out of the fertile ground he caused to grow, all trees of noblest kind, for sight, smell, taste, and all the midst of the tree of life, high eminent, blooming ambrosial fruit of vegetable gold, and next to life, our death, the tree of knowledge grew fast by. The most interesting line there in the poem, from the point of view of this presentation this evening, is, and all the midst of the tree of life, that's really the subject of this presentation tonight and um, the forthcoming book. All amid them stood the tree of life. So Milton was talking about the Garden of Eden, and the popular press often refers to Eden when spectacular uh, places are uh, discovered or discussed. I'm thinking about a few years ago, there was a, um, uh, uh, a mountain forest that was discovered, apparently using Google Earth. And this was in Mozambique, and it had not suffered from, from much in the way of human intrusion in its history. And a lot of news coverage about this place talked about this, this uh, forgotten Eden. And I'd like you to think for a second about if you think about Eden or and Eden, or a paradise, what kind of place comes to mind, what do you think of? Is it an obvious example here? Is it the example of uh, Eden, the clownfish, the classic mutualism? But what other places do you think about? I spent a little bit of time this afternoon, amazingly, in, in our rainforest on this, this, this campus. Beautiful place, it's an Eden of sorts. Give me a couple of other, maybe some other students here. And some places that you visited that you just thought were just spectacularly beautiful in a, in a biological sense. Two answers, two places. Jasper. Where? Jasper, Alberta. Okay. And yeah, but what, what kind of a, a habitat is, is, is there? What kind of an ecosystem? More of a subarctic. Subarctic? Yeah, okay. Probably li living here. The, 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 uh, the vegetation here wouldn't seem perhaps as interesting to go somewhere else and 
experience something different. Another idea? This would be the new national park and it would be open. Uh, six feet long, but since it's not a national park, I can open it to the public as I'm doing this evening. It's about six feet long, three feet deep, and you can see my six fish there. And this wasn't the exact place that uh, Thoreau described in Walden, but it might as well have been. Thoreau in Walden, he contemplated life beneath the ice his poem. It's one of the most beautiful passages in Walden. He says, he wrote, kneeling to drink, I looked down into the quiet parlor of the fishes, pervaded by a softened light as through a window of brown glass, with its bright sanded floor the same as in summer. There is a perennial waveless serenity. There, a perennial waveless serenity reigns, as in the amber twilight sky, corresponding to the cool and even temperament of the inhabitants. Heaven is under our feet as well as over our heads. All of them to the tree of life. So my pond has all we need. It's 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 got a, it's 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 complete in its uh, in its coverage when it comes to biological diversity. So I'm going to get you over the course of the next few minutes. If we look at eukaryotes, so organisms whose cells are like our cells, built from bacterial components with our genetic material, most of it uh, in the uh, housed within the nucleus of the cell. If you look at all of the eukaryotes, the way that biologists um, tend to carve up that uh, part of life, if the eukaryotes are only one part, um, is to, to create uh, uh, is, to, is to carve up life into a series of supergroups, and there's eight of them. And in this case, what I've done is to, to, to picture this as a wheel of eukaryotic life. And you've got the supergroups arranged around the circumference, and they're linked by spokes to a central hub. And that might represent the ancestral eukaryote, the ancestor from all of the eukaryotes, or the land of more than one, that was derived from simpler prokaryotes, progenitors. And you'll see that some, some of the common prototypes that unite some of the groups are indicated by these intermediate segments. But what I want to do here is to just run around that wheel swiftly and show you representatives of all of these organisms that live in my pond. So the first group then, the amoebozoans, contain the, the iconic single-celled organism, amoeba proteus, and I can fish this thing out of my pond quite Readily. And this picture here was, this illustration was, was produced by Joseph Lee, who was, um, I'll show you a couple of images from Lee. He was a real fan of the, the, the Amoeba Zone, so actually another group of, of eukaryotes, and beautiful illustrations that were published in a monograph in the 19th century. Lee was interesting because he was, he was interesting for a lot of reasons. and. Um, he was, he was absolutely fascinated with uh, single cell forms of life. And he wrote uh, at some, it's actually part of a lecture that he gave, he said, how can life be tiresome so long as there is still a new rise of what I'm described? How can life possibly be tiresome when we don't know all of the forms of life that look a little bit like this? So we can find these in, in find them, I can find an amoeba proteus in, in, in my pond and it uh, migrates um, over the, uh, the inner surface of, of the pond, the pond lining, it's a plastic lining, but the amoebas will, all, the amoeba will also um, glide along the, the air water in 
to face a war of sign and gulf uh, bacterial cells and the cells of, of other kind of single cell um, eukaryotes and stuff them into its food vacuole and digest them uh, rather like the amoeboid cells in our immune system operate. But this is only one of the representatives of this vast grouping of, of um, organisms within the amoeba zones. Um, there are testate amoebae. Uh, these, are, these are amoebae, this is another um, leading uh, illustration, that form a shell, like a, it's a shape like an green amphora, and they produce this shell themselves. In this case, it's a silica-based structure. And then you can see the pseudopodia emerging from the, uh, the base of this structure. And what these kinds of uh, test data need to do is that they'll, they'll crawl over surfaces holding the, the test of the shell in an erect orientation. And there's lots and lots of these in my pond. And the thing is with the amoeba zones, as I said, it's a vast grouping of organisms. You, you may well have heard of, of, of slime molds. There's lots and lots of different groups of slime molds. But the, the, the slime mold that's been studied most, in most detail, Dictyostelium discoideum, it's the organism that was popularized by uh, John uh, Bonner, um, a drummer in that Zeppelin or something. He was also is a biologist, or a retired biologist from Princeton. He popularized this this slime mold. And uh, that's also an example of the amoeba zone. And you can find the genes of, of, of uh, the genetic signature of Dictyostelium pretty much every, anywhere you look. We don't really know what it does. We don't know what it's doing in the aquatic environment. I'm going to speed up here and talk about some of these other groups. The next group, the Hacrobians. The Hacrobians are represented in my plant. One example that we find are the um, cryptomonad algae, so these are photosynthetic organisms, and these are the ultimate when it comes to the, 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 the Russian nesting doll uh, construction of uh, the eukaryote cell, the, the uh, matryoshka doll, the cell, of the cell. Um, as we are, I mean, we, we've got uh, at least two genomes in our cells in the form of our nuclear genome and the, uh, the, the uh, genome in our mitochondria, as does, so that would be numbers one and two in this kind of alga. But in addition to those two um, sources of genetic information, cryptomonad and algae have a large chloroplast that sits in, in the cell, and that actually has two, two separate um, uh, 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 pieces of genetic information. One in the center of the chloroplast is actually a bacterial genome. And we find that all chloroplasts, um, in, in, including those if, that we find in plants then, that they have a cyanobacterial genome in the center of the uh, chloroplast. But in addition to that, genome four here is actually a remnant genome of a red alga. In the evolutionary history of this organism, there was, an, was a eukaryote that was a lot like uh, an amoeba, and it engulfed the red alga. Back in the origin of the red alga, the red alga, the ancestor of the red alga, had actually eaten the cyanobacterium. So you can see that the way that these cells um, the complexity arises through this, this process of endosymbiosis, one organism engulfing another, but rather than digesting and taking it on board, engaging in a partnership that then carries all of the genetic information down the great stream of time. This is another example of um, an acrobium, uh, and this is a marine acrobium, it's a coccolithophorin alga. If you look at the exhibition in the Easing Museum uh, of the Patrick Keeling's photographs and other images, you'll see examples of these beautiful coccolithophora in algae. But these are marine organisms, incredibly important in, uh, in the carbon cycle and acting as refrigerants against global warming. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Don't find these in the pond. I actually find them in the paving slabs around the pond, though, because those are made of, of limestone, and that limestone actually is formed from the calcium carbonate discs or coccoliths that actually protect the, the or form on the outside of that outer cell. What do we got next? Stromatopiles. Stromatopiles are, are, are among my favorites. There's a lot of stromatopiles in my, my pond. Stromatopiles include, include diatoms. Uh, beautiful cells, these are the 
pan of panic diatoms, and you can see that they've got that, that groove, actually, it's a pair of grooves that run along the surface of the, the, um, uh, the, the shell of the, of, of the diatom. And it's, it, it's thought that extrusion of mucilage into that groove actually allows diatoms to glide over surfaces. And if you've ever watched uh, diatoms, if you've ever looked at a pond sample and seen diatoms move, it's, it's really intriguing the way they bump into one another and then glide past one another, move away, change direction. It's, it, it's really absolutely fascinating. And it's, it's one of the tragedies of, of uh, uh, the kind of biological education that uh, uh, frankly, I engaged in as a younger professor when we actually introduced students to the microscope. Perhaps one of the exercises that we we, we um, share with our students is that they look at pond water, and largely we do this as an exercise that they can learn how to use the microscope. But really, looking at pond water is again, as Lee said, you know, how can life be, be uninteresting? Just looking at pond water, we should be doing it as soon as you leave here this evening. You should race to the nearest microscope. <laughs> Look at pond water. The other thing we do in those, those, those labs, and I've got a lot of criticism of, 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 and myself rather than biology educators in general, you think about the cheek screen, what, you know, that, that, that you do to look at epithelial cells in, in those microscopy labs, and you plop that in a drop of water and put a cover slip, slip on it, and you look at this and you, use, you learn how to use the condenser. But the students really should be bouncing off the walls if they realize what they're looking at. Look at that, look at that cell. This is you. You're, you're, you're made up of the same kind of things that we find in pond water. That little fried, fried egg that you're seeing there, and then you place all of your genetic information, nuclear DNA, the information that you inherited from your, your parents, is there in that nucleus. This should be a wondrous experience. This should, take, this should be a six hour lab rather than let's <laughs> move on and play it to something else. You know, diatoms are really cool. Nobody really knows how they how they move. Um, beautiful experiments were conducted on diatom motility in the 1970s and 80s, but we still really don't have a compelling explanation, by a mechanical explanation for the way that diatoms move. But this is a crazy organism, a crazy organism. This is an organism that we find in the pond that's probably less familiar. It's actually a water model, and it's a thing called haptoglossa. We find haptoglossa uh, or haptoglossa-like genes everywhere we look. And this is a predatory um, water mold. It looks like, it looks predatory, doesn't it? It's an electron uh, drawing based on an electron micrograph. What it does is that it hangs around on surfaces, submerged plant leaves, waiting for rotifers or water bears or nematodes to glide past. And if they touch the end there, the, see those little crosses at the end of this, this diagram, that actually triggers this harpoon to actually penetrate the unwitting invertebrate. And that the, the, the structure there is indeed a, the, the, the needle actually penetrates the, the nematode or other kind of animal. And then the whole of the interior of that cell everts down the tube and is transferred into the animal. The animal swims away, glides away, but it carries the seeds of its destruction inside its, its tissues. So this is a predatory kind of water model. And they're everywhere that we look at these using genetic techniques. Um, what's another group here? This one, um, we're going to talk about dinoflagellates, and there are lots and lots of dinoflagellates in my pond, depending on the time of year, and none of them's quite as interesting as this one. This is a bit of a cheat for me to put this in here, because this particular dinoflagellate um, is a marine dinoflagellate that has been studied uh, by a number of, uh, uh, number of research groups. I'm looking for my note here on the most recent study this particular kind of flag. And you can see that it's got an eye. And Brian Leander's research group, uh, among others, have looked at this particular kind of alga recently. So the alveolator include dinoflagellates. This particular dinoflagellate then has an eye. And it really is an eye. A single cell, but it's an eye. That dangly thing is a piston, and nobody really knows what the piston does. You can see the eye, the need a laser pointer. You can see it there. There's this lens-like structure. It is a lens, a series of, um, it's a, a paracrystalline structure, a series of protonaceous layers forming a clear lens that sits above a photoreactive cup, I mean, or retina. This is an eye. And these beautiful, beautiful experiments that were conducted some decades ago at um, the Scripps Oceanographic Institute um, 
for scientists, the, the kind of science that, that there's so little of this kind of experimentation that goes on today, he actually carried out ophthalmic, uh, ophthalmic uh, uh, investigations on this, this particular kind of dinoflagellate, called them one of it. And what he did was to dissect down the eyes of these dinoflagellates as they screened on this microscope stage, and flick out the lens, and they actually determined, so it was like in the eye exam, this way, or this way, this way, or this way. But they actually determined that it had a 30 degree field of view, and that it would actually fill the, um, the, the one of its um, worst enemies, one of its most feared enemies, was a one millimeter diameter crustacean. And it would actually be able to see this coming towards it at about a distance of about two millimeters and get out of the way before it was eaten. So he thought that this eye had evolved as this, this anti predator device to allow the, the alga to get the heck out of there before it was eaten. So you can imagine it's a bit like in, with the, uh, the squid then and then seeing the shadow of the sperm whale bearing down upon it. And uh, so we don't really know nothing about actually how these activities are regulated. There's another possibility which is actually that the, the, the dinoflagellate is actually using this to actually find its own prey. It's actually looking around with its cyclopean and detecting prey, finding its way to it, eating it. But who would have known? Single cell with this. What else? Rhizarians. Rhizarians are interesting organisms. They interested Lidi. Um, and they, they include um, a whole group of um, testate and Lidi that are not really at all very, very distantly related to other amoeba zones. They actually form a shell in the form of these plates here and these teeth at the bottom. And rather than uh, pseudopodia, they have these fine extensions called phylopodia that emerge from the, uh, uh, from the opening in the shell. And the organism crawls over surfaces and holds its fora erect. The other organisms, that there's much, again, a huge, huge diversity in, the, um, in this group. Um, Xenophyophores are interesting. These are. Um, I don't have a picture of the you know, fire force here, but these are giant and maybe they look like cauliflowers and they sit on the sea floor and they've actually been photographed at uh, tremendous depths down in the Marianas Trench, for example. They appear to be very common organisms at these very, very deep locations. They're probably the largest single cell organisms on Earth. They're enormous cells. They're enormous cauliflower shaped bags of nuclei. It's a single cell and they feed by accreting particles from the little that fall through the water column. Beautiful, beautiful organisms. So I find you lift these things in my pond, but not unfortunately these giant maybe because otherwise they eat my fish. Almost done here, archaeoplastids. The archaeoplastids include the things that botanists study, but they also include far more interesting organisms like the green algae. Some botanists study the green algae. But if you want to really look at diversity within uh, this particular group of organisms in terms of, 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 of life cycles, in terms of genetics, it's, it's among the green algae where one has to look. I've got an example here this colonial green algae volpox, probably kind of inducing on water samples. But I'll be criticizing uh, uh, plants in much more detail shortly uh, for, for, for the botanists in the room, including myself. Spirogyra, filamentous green algae, also in this group. So that's where all the plants sit. They're one fragment of this supergrouping of organisms that we call the archaeoplastids. Uh, the excavates, excavator, excavator, they include um, the euglenoid algae. There's lots of euglenoids in my pond. There's a beautiful thing called phagus that's a heart-shaped cell that, 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 that actually twists and spins and then it's got this larger gyro that it follows and it, as it swims through the water. It's one of the dominant organisms in terms of cell numbers. Um, in the uh, early part of the year, in the early spring, and we've got this beautiful proteinaceous pellicle on the surface. So, I'm, where are we? Where are, where are humans? These are the algae. But then we sit, along with the fungi and lots of other organisms, in the epistoconta. So, all of the animals can be stuck into this single group in the epistoconta that also includes all of the fungi. And animals are probably even less interesting than plants in biological sense, as I'm going to talk about more as this presentation proceeds. 
we really know so little about the, the true scale of the biodiversity within each of these, these supergroups. And an interesting example of that comes from actually looking at the Pestlicanta, where a new phylum of Pestlicants was discovered in 2011. And unfortunately, it wasn't a phylum of animals. We didn't find a new um, phylum of, I mean, we, we're, we're, what phylum do we sit in? The core data, so it's all the way from uh, sea squirts to John Boner, opposite direction. It's all in, in the core data, a single phylum of animals. Okay. Well, a new phylum of Epistocons was discovered recently, and it's, it's, it's a group of fungi where we actually find greater genetic diversity in this formerly completely unknown group of organisms than we find in all of the rest of the fungi. And mycologists all the time talk about just the, the, the species richness and diversity of the organisms that we, that we study. But in 2011, uh, this, this wholly new group of organisms was uh, discovered and told um, the cryptomycota, for, for obvious reasons. And it's been shown actually since, since that study came out that actually we did know one of these organisms previously, and it's the one shown here. It's a fungus called rosella. that's actually a parasite of other, other fungi. But all of the rest of the cryptomycota are only known from their genetic signature. As I say, based upon one metric, they appear to be more diverse than all of the rest of the fungi combined. We can amplify those, their, their genes from uh, almost any water sample that's been, been looked at. So they've been found in freshwater ecosystems, they've been found in brackish water, they've been found in drinking water in France, chlorinated drinking water in France. You find these, the, the, the genetic signature of these organisms. Whether they're actually living in French drinking water or not is not known. We don't know anything about the biology of these organisms because we can't grow them in culture. They appear to be um, they appear to be organisms that interact with other um, single-celled organisms in these aquatic environments. So it may be that they're parasites of diatoms and some of the other things that I've been showing you here. But they're in my backyard pond. All right, so there's all of this diversity then in the eukaryotes. That diversity is utterly equipped, eclipsed by the, the prokaryotes. We've got the first picture ever of a prokaryote with, with um, uh, from uh, Lillenhoek's work in the, the 17th century. There it is, that spectacular structured cell uh, from Lillenhoek's uh, studies. And again, if you look in the exhibition in the, the Beating Museum, there's this, this um, uh, lovely description there of some of uh, Patrick Healing's work, where he actually, uh, I don't know if Patrick or his students are here this evening, but actually making the same kinds of microscopes or the same kinds of lenses that. Uh, Lillenhoek actually created and, and these lenses that he used for his very early work on uh, microorganisms or microscopic forms of, forms of life. Now, it's very, very difficult to, to, to actually compare and contrast genetic diversity at the level of these large groupings of organisms. It's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to justify. I believe it's true, but it was a, it'd be a difficult thing to really, really measure and say that the fungi as a whole are much more diverse than all of the animals. But I think we can make a very good case that the, the prokaryotes, the bacteria, and the archaea, separate group of the prokaryotes, are actually much more diverse than all of the eukaryotes combined. One of the ways of doing this, so other than using genetics as a metric, is to think about the way that um, all of the eukaryotes work. So let's just think about plants and animals. Plants all work in, there's only one way of being a plant, and there are a few exceptions. We can think of achlorophilus, parasitic uh, orchids, and uh, think about insectivorous plants that uh, uh, cheat a little bit, perhaps. But most plants obviously carry out oxygenic photosynthesis. They make food, they spin sugars using sunlight. And so we describe those as photolitho, Autotrophs. All plants work in this fashion. Plants are skyscrapers that carry cyanobacteria towards our star, competing for space, they're competing for more photons, and in a sense they're parasitized by cyanobacteria that have become their chloroplasts. We think about animals, but actually this is true of, of, of a lot of, if not the vast majority of, 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 um, of 
bacteria too. We find that they decompose as their chemo organo heterotrophs, they're breaking down materials produced by other organisms. And there's mixotrophs that do a, do a bit of both. But if, if, we, if we explore the prokaryote world more, more in more detail, and look at bacteria and archaea, we find that there are many, many different ways of making a living on this planet. You're probably aware of some of these. There are photolithoautotrophs, which are um, bacteria that carry out photosynthesis without evolving oxygen. Uh, purple bacteria, green bacteria, green non sulfur bacteria, heliobacteria. Um, we've got photoorganoheterotrophs, archaea, most of them have been looked at in marine organisms that use sunlight as a supplementary energy source. Um, we've got chemolithoautotrophs, bacteria and archaea that oxidize inorganic compounds and fix carbon dioxide. And they're stripping electrons from very simple, uh, uh, actually from elements like, like, like sulfur, but also simple compounds like hydrogen, um, elements like iron, uh, and also uh, uh, nitrogen containing uh, compounds. Chemolithoheterotrophs, they oxidize inorganic compounds with you know, fixed carbon dioxide. Methylotrophs that work with, they strip electrons from very simple, um, uh, very simple molecules, uh, C1 compounds, even carbon monoxide, for example. So there are these microorganisms in the prokaryote world that uh, uh, work in a very, very different fashion from all of the, the plants and, and animals. And um, this is this is one of the reasons that we can be sure that when in, in, in the lower 48, we, we still uh, all of us subscribe to the Weekly World News and other tabloids that they were waiting for the latest story of alien abduction. And the Ohio farmer that that's, that's patiently plowing his field and then bright light in the sky. And the next thing he knows is he wakes up in the morning and doesn't know what's happened to the last many many hours. And over time, through hypnosis, his, his, uh, his experiences are revealed, and they normally involve some form of sexual exploration by these aliens. So this is this is the same story. I know that that's false, though. I love reading the story, but I know that it's false because probably the one bestseller in the whole universe is um, Adam Smith's *The Wealth of Nations*. So uh, anywhere we go in the universe. It's going to be driven by capitalism. Okay? There's a company on planet Zeta that's going to fund an expedition to send a spacecraft all this way to collect biological samples. When, when that spaceship gets back to planet Zeta, they're going to be really pissed if the only things that the aliens can show is a video of them assaulting an Ohio farmer. What they're going to do, they, you know, they're going to pay for this. They're going, to, they're going to mine the genetic riches of, of, of our planet to create new products, and they're going to do this by doing just the sorts of things that Craig Venter and other researchers do in collecting samples of soil and water and you name it, small samples. They're going to be looking for these genetic riches in new ways of actually uh, mining energy from, from, from chemical compounds. So, which is a bit of a cheat, though, in a way, because if you could get the Kansas farmer or the Ohio farmer back to the planet, there's a lot of stuff going on in his gut that I'll talk about in a minute that's really very, very interesting. So maybe the quote was of some of this. Um, actually, at this point, I've been lying. Everything I've said is a lie so far. It's because, of course, we all know that the most genetic information on this planet is in the form of viruses, molecular organisms. Just beautiful work recently about these giant viruses, giant nucleocytoplasmic with DNA viruses that appear to be everywhere that we look. They they paint every surface on the planet. Um, these extraordinary organisms. Some some of these actually have larger genomes than cellular organisms, and some of them are actually larger than the smallest kinds of, of eukaryotes. So this incredible um, diversity of uh, of viruses. For, for a number here. There's some nice figures that come from studies on uh, uh, marine ecosystems. Um, viruses are by far the most abundant biological entities in the oceans, comprising approximately 94% of the nucleic acid contained in the organisms. Yet, if you watch any documentary on TV about marine life, it's very unlikely that viruses will be mentioned. some problems with that. Yeah, so perhaps we've been barking on the wrong tree. 
there's some consequences of this. So a nice paper that was published last year in fossil biology, and this is one of the figures from that paper. It's looking at catalog species, so the things for which we have, in most cases, a, a, a Linnaean, a, a Latin binomial, sapiens, and so forth. And so if you look at the number of catalog species, and their estimate that they were using here was about 2 million species. Most of the things that are cataloged are metazoans, they're multicellular, uh, they're animals. Um, the fungi get quite a good look in here for 73,000 species, something like that, I think it's right. The they the green plants. Um, so this is what, what, we've, what we've achieved in the, the, the uh, 250 years since, since Linnaeus. But if we look at biology, we look at the planet using uh, genetic techniques, and rather than trying to actually look at organisms under the microscope and trying to grow things in culture, we just look at what's out there genetically. This is just one of many, uh, many reviews of this, this, this sort of data. We see that the picture changes hugely. I mean, look at this, the big, the big group there, so environmental OTUs, operational taxonomic units, we're just looking at genetic signatures of organisms. The alveolates now, including things like dinoflagellates, appear to be dominant in this system. Incredible, unexplored biological diversity there. And the same goes for these other, other groups, the stromatophiles, who knew? Stromatophiles. Incredibly important. So this is where I grew up. I've lived in the United States since 1986. I'm a citizen in 2000. But this is where I grew up. It's the Thames Valley in, uh, in southern England. And my dear mother still lives there. And plump a tree there. If we look at this, it's a good enough place called Whitman Clumps. Is, is, is there any of you have been here? And that's actually the River Thames. And when you look at nature, when you look at this picture here, what do you see? You see plants and you see animals. And I'm assuming that those, what are they, wildebeest or something? I suppose they're the sheep. <laughs> they are sheep because look, there's two, there's two black ones. There's two black sheep in that picture. So it must be sheep. I don't actually remember there being sheep there, the, the village that's close by is a place called Porchester. But we're, 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 all, we're given this impression through our senses that plants and animals are it. And yet, they're not. They really, really are not. Here we are. Let me tell you how many microbes are out there. If this cup were filled with seawater, it could hold as many as 125 million cells. A scoop of ocean, open ocean would capture 25 million cyanobacteria, preyed upon by two and a half billion bacteriophages. These are uh, viruses that attack um, these, these bacteria. Incredible. The dominant bacterium, according to some studies in, in the oceans, dominant photosynthetic bacterium, is a thing called Prochlorococcus. It absorbs 20 billion tons of carbon a year, accounting for 20% of the global carbon fixation making this single prokaryote a stronger refrigerant than all of the world's tropical rainforests. Marine diatoms, I showed you this, <coughs> panic diatoms, but there are beautiful marine diatoms. Uh, they fix about the same amount of carbon as prochlorococcus. And so, so together we've got this, this two components of the marine plankton responsible for the, at least half of the carbon fixation on planet Earth. Um, if this were filled with forest soil, it would be populated by 25 billion prokaryotes, a greater number of viruses, river water would compete with this, the Thames River, but then 250 million cells, or a billion cells in, in a couple of that river Thames water. How about the air? Um, the highest recorded spore count ever recorded is in the Guinness Book of Records, recorded above Car Cardiff, Wales in 1971. And according to those spore counts, so just a cup of that air would contain 200 fungal spores. So all of the atopics, all of the as asthmatic patients in Cardiff died that day. <laughs> Every single one of them. Um, in, in, in here right now, I don't know what it would be, we probably need about 20 cups to find one fungal spore. And I bet we find them despite the sophisticated air conditioning system in, in here. Um, Beautiful work by atmospheric chemists allows us to estimate uh, with some, some degree of confidence that 50 million tons of fungal spores are discharged into the atmosphere every year. And I did a back of the envelope uh, uh, calculation one day. 
that suggests that's an Avogadroian number of cells that are discharged into the atmosphere every year. So from first breath to last gasp, taking in fungal spores. An Avogadroian number of anything is an awfully big number, but the spores, I think, are particularly impressive. Now, if this were filled with my gut contents, and I'm now going to disappear for a few moments here, um, 10, trillion, uh, 10 trillion bacteria, 25 billion archaea. 10 trillion bacteria? That's incredible, isn't it? What the heck are they doing in there? Why have we missed all of these microorganisms, and what are they doing? How did we get here? The problem at this point is that even and an ecosystem or a habitat uh, like my garden pond is actually unknowable in terms of its biological riches. The reason for this is that um, there's probably around about one trillion microbial cells in my pond, plus or minus ten. Um, if I were to clone and sequence a thousand cells, which is actually the kind of thing we could do that at my Midwestern university, not a research one university, we could do that. If, if we did do that, I mean, it would take a while, it would take some resources, we'd only actually be amplifying the genetic information from one in a billion of the cells in my pond. And if you look at studies funded by the National Institutes of Health where um, uh, scientists are studying the gut microbiome and they're amplifying um, in single studies from single, single stool samples to 10,000 clones, the mathematics still are, 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 are working against us. There's a hundred trillion bacteria in the human gut. We're only able to, in a, in a, in amplifying from a single stool sample, 10,000 plums. That's, that's, we're not quite there. How the heck have we got here? How after all of these years, all of this, this biological enterprise, have we ended up in this dreadful place? So, the, the first microscopes were developed, actually I talk about this in, in the new book, but probably Galileo in addition to inventing the, the telescope. At least Galileo tells us himself in his diaries that, that, that he invented the microscope too in 1610. And there's some evidence to support this. Um, microscopes were, were, were used practically then by uh, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, that I mentioned earlier, a Dutchman, and Robert Hook, um, both of the members of the Royal Society. And um, Hooke's famous work, Micrographia, was published in 1665, and it was a, a bestseller of, of its time. Uh, but Hooke was also lampooned by playwrights in that period. A restoration comment is written about, about Hooke. Why is this man studying all of these tiny forms of life? What a ridiculous way to, to expand one's four score and ten. Um, and there were certainly other microscopists that were looking at the microbial world. And the work that was begun by Robert Hooke, Lewin Hooke, in the uh, 17th century, then, you see this continued into the early, early young 18th century. And I've got a couple of 18th century images here. The one on the left comes from a wonderful book called the Nova Plantarum Genera that was published in 1729 by Anton Michele. He was a Florentine genius who, he really, he overturned spontaneous generation more than a century before Pasteur. But his work, his experimental work was overlooked. I mean, nobody was doing experimental work on microorganisms other than uh, Anton Michele. There's a beautiful statue of Michele outside the Uffizi Museum in Florence, but he's, he's not best known but the scientists. Um, but he worked on fungi, which is one of the reasons I'm interested in him. You can see here one of his illustrations of, 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 of some fungi, and these are, these are fungal spores that he was looking at. He managed to show that spores were, were, were seed-like structures produced by fungi that could, could produce the next generation. Another person was a Swiss investigator called Abraham Trembley, and he was actually looking at, 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 at hydra, so these, these simple animals, microscopic, just about microscopic of a microscope, you can see it with the naked eye. Um, but he was using some simple microscopes to, to study these organisms. And he was a sensation in, in, in pre-revolutionary France. He was the toast of the salons of Paris. Everybody wanted to piece of the trembling action and uh, to learn more about his studies on these, these polyps. And he would dissect them, and, and, and both halves would, would, would generate. 
The character that ruins all of this is, 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 uh, is Linnaeus, the Swedish botanist. Because Linnaeus didn't like Michele. He didn't care for him at all. He said some very rude things about him. And Linnaeus really didn't have any time for microorganisms. He didn't have any time for fungi. Um, uh, it would take a while to get into this, but he was very dismissive of the fungi. And in a sense, uh, in a sense, he did. He was, he was stuck really with an Aristotelian view of, of biological diversity, diversity, that he was interested in plants and animals, and that's where it stopped. And that's really all that biology did, speaking in you know, broad brushstrokes here, for another century, is we documented plant and animal diversity and gave them Latin binomials following Linnaeus's instructions in the system of naturae. Pasteur and other scientists become more interested in microorganisms, really partly because of the technological innovations in the 19th century, so a century later. But then this is a study of disease-causing organisms. It's the negative interactions between humans and microorganisms. It's, you don't get much of a sense there of, of, of reverence for the microbial world or basic studies in interest in this. It seems to me that we're stuck, and we've been stuck, and there's certainly a number of people in this room that are not stuck at all, and are, are engaged in brilliant research on microbial biodiversity, but still the way that we, most scientists work, the way that most biologists work, we, we, we're still sort of stuck with this Aristotelian uh, paradigm, if, if, if you like. Um, Pliny, who, Pliny the Elder, who, who died at Vesuvius in 1879, he set out with a very modest goal in his um, Historia Natura, um, Naturalis Historia, which is sort of over there. Um, very, very modest goal. It's a multi volume set in the low classics. It's a beautiful read. Um, he set out with the, the modest goal of describing the, the contents of the entire world. Very modest goal. <laughs> then he got killed after Vesuvius. And he, he described one of his, his, his best descriptions is, is of the basilisk serpent. You may have heard of this. The basilisk um, kills bushes not only by its touch, also I'm translating directly from the Latin here, kills bushes not only by its touch, but also by its breath, scorches up grass and bursts rocks. Its effect on other animals is disastrous. It's believed that once one killed with a spear by a man on horseback, um, it, it, sorry, I'll read that again. It is believed that once one was killed with a spear by a man on horseback, and the infection rising through the spear killed not only the rider but the horse. So, <laughs> all this made up stuff. But you know, he was describing the contents of the entire world. The problem is, however, that we're still doing this. One of the stated objectives of many taxonomists is to describe all the species. The great E.O. Wilson, with his Encyclopedia of Life project, it's this goal of, and this has been in progress now for, for some, some time, to describe all of the species. Very prominent scientists in Britain, including Lord Mayor of the Royal Society, talk about how much money will it take to describe all the world's species. They're still doing what Pliny was trying to do 2,000 years ago. Why? Why are we doing this? The justification is based upon conservation. I think the real justification is that if we can describe all the world's species and write them down on tablets, mm -hmm. is so that when the aliens do come, and we know they're coming, that we'll be able to show them all the stuff that we destroyed in our lifetime. <laughs> I think that's the only practical benefit of doing this. If you look at describing all the world's species, where, where are we at? Where are we at? We're here. I'm not a great fan of the Simpsons, but I like this. Just good. Look at this, the tree of life. Look at my amoeba in the room. It's there, simple one-cell life forms. It's miserable looking creature in the bottom. All the interesting stuff, you've got fungi in limbo, you've got an athlete's foot. So you've got a branch of biological diversity there. And we've got uh, newts and big newts here. But look at, the, look at the way that this popular depiction of the tree of life, it's, it's, it's animal dominated, isn't it? Are there any plants there at all? Is there anything photosynthetic there? I have to look around for a while. 
one. Rabbits, mice, and cats. It's, it's very animal centric. But in fact, if you look at, at uh, slightly more serious science, we get the same kind of picture. The Tree of Life, a very popular website, you go there all the time to learn things about different groups of organisms. But you probably can't see this, but the, um, the great bulk of this is, is animals. The fungi get a bit of a look in here, and the plants certainly do, 250,000 species. Archaea and bacteria, but that's where most of the diversity is. So we try to describe all the world species, but we're, we're not really concentrating on the interesting things, in my humble opinion. There are implications to this. Oh, I don't want to go there. Either. Well, we can go there. You've seen it now. This is Rene Descartes' skull. I'm going to explain why I've got that up here shortly. There, there are some problems with, with, with this. I don't have uh, much more, more to say. I'm going to land with a little bit of, sort of amateur uh, philosophy here. I have a picture of Rene Descartes looking at us. Um, in science education, at least in my university, in introductory biology classes, and I think this is probably the same in most institutions where I've gone and looked at introductory biology syllabi, we spend most time talking about plants and animals. The fungi might get a lecture. Other microorganisms, they might get a lecture. This is completely wrong. If, if, if you look at, if you have a, have a more um, uh, sensible reading of biological diversity, what we should be doing is the plants get a lecture, the animals get a lecture, and the rest of biology's introduction to life on Earth actually deals with microorganisms. The way that we teach biology today is no more sensible than trying to teach English literature by having students read one Harry Potter book. In a survey of English literature, here's your Harry Potter book, that's it. That's what we're doing. This is a gross misreading of life. Descartes' discourse on method. Let me say just a few words about the human microbiome. I'm just going to read you a, um, um, just, just a few sentences from, from the book then, uh, that will be published early next year. The gut micro microbiome. So, knowledge of the gut microbiome changes the balance a little. A high, highly bacterial nature seems significant to me in an emotional sense. I'm captivated by the revelation that my breakfast feeds 100 trillion bacteria and archaea, and they feed me with short-chain fatty acids. And that, that's a fact of life, that, that when you eat breakfast cereal, humans are really good at digesting uh, uh, starch with a lot of amylase. It's more than the other apes. And it's one of the facets of our, fascinating features of our, our genome. And so when we eat complex carbohydrates, or when we eat breakfast cereal, there's enough in the way in the form of starch that we can break down that starch and get a sugar pulse. But there's a lot of material in that breakfast cereal, wheat flakes or something like that, that, we, that the human genome doesn't encode the enzymes needed to, to digest those complex plant carbohydrates. And in fact, they have to hit the microbiome before the bacteria will break down those materials, the materials and then the bacteria will feed us. So we're farmed by our bacteria. We're farm animals. Everybody in the room is an African ape. We've known that for a long, long time. Everybody in the room is a farm animal. And we farm the bacteria, too. They can't go very far without us. It's tempting to say that the gut microbiome lives and dies with us, but this distinction between organisms is inadequate. Our lives are inseparable from the get-go. The more we learn about the theater of our peristaltic cylinder, the more we lose the illusion of control. We carry the microbes around and feed them. They deliver the power that allows us to do, do so. And that's either terrifying or, 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 or liberating. A bit of both. The body becomes anoxic soon after we stop breathing, creating a once in a lifetime opportunity, literally, for the internal oxygen loading symbionts to digest the gut wall and migrate into the surrounding tissues. This is evidenced in the blood stage of decomposition as carbon dioxide, methane, and hydrogen sulfide gases accumulate in the rotting corpse. So the terrifying or illuminating uh, satisfying both. Fluids in the corpse become frothy with bacteria too and seep into the surrounding environment as the skin ruptures. Until then, Caco Virgo Sun. I shit, therefore I am. That's why Descartes is wrong. Virgo Sun. I think, therefore I am. 
No, I shed that for I am. <laughs> Descartes was wrong in another sense, too. You wake up in the morning, and a morning like, like, like this one, it's, it's, it's sunny outside, and it's not raining, and you feel happy. Are you feeling happy, really, or is it that you made your bacteria feel happy, so they're releasing some serotonin into your nervous system and allowing you to, to feel a little bit more, more chipper? Some beautiful experiments that are done with mice, not a biotic mice that are raised without any microbiome. The behavior of these mice changes in very, very profound ways. You have to feed them more, too, because the mice don't have bacteria in their guts, and so you've got to stuff more readily available calories into them so that they can meet their energetic needs, so they eat more, and their whole behavior changes. We talk more about, about that. But this raises this, this scary idea then, that indeed our moods are partly regulated by the activity of the microorganisms in our gut. So this is either terrifying or liberating, and of course it's a bit, a bit of both. So I'll leave you with a happy thought that I shit, therefore I am. Perhaps you too. And thank you for coming this evening.